Revelation chapter number 15. Verse number one, the Bible says, <clears throat> And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breast girded with golden girdles and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, if you'll remember last week, we talked about Christ coming on a cloud, thrusting his sickle in and reaping unto Christ what Christ had bought and paid for. Again, that was the church. Then we see an angel come and in like manner with a sickle, reap unto him the vine of God. If you'll remember, it said that that vine was full then the vine was cast into the wine press of God's wrath. Okay? Well, in verse number 15, or I mean, sorry, chapter number 15, okay, John the Revelator says, and, we don't know when this happens, but we know that this is something that he saw. Okay, I got a pretty good idea when it happens. When does it happen? Well, it happens before the battle of Armageddon, and it happens after the seven seals and the seven horns that we had already heard. Well, it says, saw another sign in heaven, great marvels. Seven angels having seven last plagues. When does this happen? Right at the end of the great tribulation, before the battle of Armageddon, but it's towards the end. These are the last seven plagues that God will pour out upon the earth. Well, what do they consist of? It says, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. God's wrath against the people that had rejected His Son, that had embraced the Antichrist, that had persecuted His people down to 144,000 people. The fullness of God's wrath is contained in seven last plagues. Give that in mind. Then it says, verse number 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Now who are these people that had victory over the beast? They were the ones in the wilderness, the 144,000. If you'll remember not too long ago, they followed the Lamb. What did they do? They rejected the Antichrist and they embraced the Christ. And they were led according to him. If you go back a little bit further, talking about that woman in the wilderness, it said that God always made a haven for her. That there wasn't a place that the Antichrist could find her because God had hidden her, had made a place for her. And that that place would move from time to time. They were never at home, they were never settled, but there was always a place that God had reserved for them to be protected and provided for. That they were in the wilderness, where the wild lands. Right, the places that are inhospitable to human life. Okay, well, if you look at that map over yonder, where these people may, I don't know where they're going to be hiding in the wilderness. But I do know that the events of the end times, when it comes to the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ coming back and landing on the Mount of Olives, I know that it's over in ancient Israel. So what are you saying, Brother George? Where are they hiding at? They're hiding out in the desert. They're hiding out in rocks and cliffs and caves. 
Okay, sound familiar? Isn't that where David found refuge when Saul the king tried to kill him? Okay, even man got enough sense when one of those seals was open and God rolled back the sky and man had to look upon the face of a holy God. Where did they run? To the rocks and the hills, crying that the rocks would fall on them. Even there, they sought refuge where? Among the strong places, caves, earthen strongholds. Well, where are these people going to find refuge? I don't know, but it's out in the wilderness. Likely in those places, out in the desert. But then again, God winking at our ignorance, we'd say, yeah, a cave would make sense. It's a place to hide. God would hide them in plain sight. What are you talking about, Brother Jordan? Well, look, if you will. Verse number two, it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Mingled means mixed. Mingled means that you can't tell where one really starts and the other one ends. Okay, they've become a part of one another. Inseparable, if you will. Okay, we know oil and water can't mix. It'll always separate. It's actually a lie. If you get this thing called an emulsifier, you can mix them together. That's where, where you break it down so small that they can't separate no more. But anyway, if you pour oil, water, syrup, a whole bunch of different viscosities, they separate. They're not mingled. You can clearly see where one starts and one stops. The line of demarcation, if you will, between two things. Well, the Apostle John said that he looked out and he saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. You can't tell where one starts and the other one stops. He looked out and the landscape was, as it were, a sea of glass and fire. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying, that sounds a whole lot to me like what they reported after atomic test out in Nevada, New Mexico, and everywhere else. Now, I've heard my entire life. Anybody else ever heard this? That if a nuke goes off halfway around the world, the radiation is going to get up in the sky and then in the water and then in the rain, and it's going to spread all around the world. And if one nuke goes off, it's going to change our weather, it's going to change everything, and then there's going to be radioactive fallout all over the place. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, that used to be true. That's not true no more. I'm not lying to you. Go look it up. The bombs that they're talking about, those were called hydrogen bombs. Anybody remember the H-bombs that were dropped at the end of World War II? Smart people don't use them no more. Why? Because they let out a little bit of energy, but a whole lot of radiation. Okay, it was the prototype, really. It was the first one that was ever made. They said, oh, if we do this, we get a big boom. And they're like, what about the rest of that stuff? Oh, it doesn't matter. We're going to drop it on people we don't like. That's their problem. That's not our problem. But see, then people start, and they said, well, you know, there's this thing called wind. Right? There's these things called ocean currents that even though the water may start over there, it may end up right in our backyard. So then they develop this thing that nowadays they call a thermonuclear bomb. That, in its name, thermo, gives out most of its energy in heat, like a bomb, and very little radiation. In truth, America or Russia could drop a whole bunch of thermonukes on each other, and the rest of the world be fine. In fact, as long as you were far enough away from the blast to get away from either the shockwave or the intense heat that's let off from it, there's a good chance you're going to live. Just a little bit of time, you'd be able to go back home if your house was still standing. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying here at the end, remember, verse number one tells us that God's handing out the seven vials with the last plagues in it. It's near in the end. I don't think the Antichrist is going to be ignorant. He knows that he has a certain amount of time to accomplish what he has to accomplish. And they're coming down to the end of the line and they say, we still haven't found them. All right? Plan X. Because they've already gone through A through W. V. They're running out. Well, what's it going to be? Just drop all the nukes. 
Where? All over the place. Drop them and just wipe them out. Now you remember when I said that God may hide them right there in the middle of plain sight? May it hide them from the enemy? He promised that he had a place of protection for them? Well, John the Revelator looks at, what's he see? He sees a sea of glass mingled with fire. He doesn't say caves. He doesn't say mountains. He says it's all just flat glass. Looks like an ocean. You know what they say? True story. Go look it up. I can't remember the name of the actual glass, but the original tests that were taking place out in New Mexico, there was a glass with a green or a red hue to the glass. Where did they find it? Right in the middle of the crater where the nuke hit. Where it was detonated. They say if you hold it up, depending on the content of the sand that was turned into glass by the extreme heat, that some of them look like there's flames in the middle of the glass because of the pattern and the melted materials that were in the glass. Some of them took on that radioactive green hue. Right? Not because there was uranium, but that's because what the sand around it, if you heat it up, it's going to turn into that color. But then they also say that if you took an aerial view and you saw the ripples in the ground as it goes out, that it looked like an ocean wave coming out from one point. It looked like waves rolling across the sand. And what did you find in those waves? Found glass that was made from the heat of a nuke. Melted the sand. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that you drop enough of them, you're going to turn enough of the desert into glass. It may have waves in it. Why? Because that's the pattern of the shock wave as it expands. It may look like that glass has ripples in it. And if you get up close in it, it may look like there's flame designs in that glass because of the contents of the sand over in the Middle East. I don't know. I'm just saying it's not some thing that nobody's ever seen before. In fact, if you can get your hands on the real stuff from that New Mexico test site, it goes for a very pretty penny. Why? Because it's something rare. It's a phenomenon. Something that people haven't seen. They want to see it. Well, God's been telling people it's going to happen for thousands of years. They wonder, what's a sea of glass look like? It just looks like sand that's been superheated and turned into glass. It's a sea of glass. You ever see sand dunes? They look like waves anyway. But remember, the beginning of this verse, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, skip down to the end, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. I've already told you, modern day nukes don't pose a radiation threat like the old ones did. But it says that they come and they stand on the sea of glass. Didn't say that they walked out on it at that point. It says that they stand on the sea of glass. When they get there, I don't know. But if you drop a nuke over every square inch of the Middle East, or everywhere that you know that this person might be hiding. Doesn't it seem that it'd be a miracle from God that, that after all the explosions faded, after the blinding flash, after the shock wave, after the heat wave, after the mushroom cloud disappears, that right in the middle of the desert where they dropped all them nukes, they're just standing there safe and sound? Saying, that can't happen, Brother Jordan. He's God, he can do whatever he wants. But the point is, is that a place that was decimated, these people come out and they stand on top of what was decimated. Why? Because it says that they have victory. They're not afraid of what the beast can do to them. They're celebrating what God has already done for them. Then verse number 3, verse number 4, 
they sing a song. We'll get back to that song. But verse number 5 says, And after that I looked and behold, the temple, the tabernacle, the testimony in heaven was open. What happened? God opened the doors to his house. And out of his house, seven angels came out in verse number 6, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with golden girdles. When it talks about their breasts being girded with golden girdles, it's talking about breastplates, armor. They're pouring out plagues, but what are they doing? God sent them out to war. God is finally going to war with what? With what the world did to his son. And his messengers, they're coming out dressed for battle. There's no mixed intention there. There's no way to conspire that, well, maybe they're friendly. No, they've got a vial full of a plague. I don't know what a plague looks like, but it can't be good. And they're dressed in war clothing. Then it says, verse number 7, One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from His power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now when it says that the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God, Anybody remember back when they dedicated Solomon's temple? And God filled the house as it were, what? Smoke, a cloud, fog. When God reveals his glory, man can't really hang around. You remember when Moses asked to see him and God said, no man can see me and live, but I'll put you in the rock, I'll cover you with my hand. And I'll remove my hand after I pass by and I'll let you see my glory. God didn't say I'd let you be in my glory. He said I'll let you see it. What did Moses see? Moses saw the glory of God. But if God had dropped Moses off smack dab in the middle of God's glory, inside of it, Moses wouldn't have been able to stand it. Wouldn't have been able to survive it. How do you know? Because the smoke filled the house of God in Solomon's day when they dedicated the temple. All the priests had to run out. They couldn't stand to be in the presence of God's glory. Even in heaven, when God reveals His glory and lets it fill His house, it says no man can enter into the temple. Now you say, Brother Jordan, isn't it a weird time for God to be revealing His glory? Right here in this passage? No. Let me explain why. It says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You know what's filled those vials? It is the holiness, the righteousness of God. When God pours out His judgment, you know what the measuring stick is? God. Did He not say, Be ye holy, for I am holy? You know what cannot exist around holiness? Unholiness. You know what cannot exist when there is light? Dark. You know what cannot exist around righteousness? Unrighteousness. What has God put into those vials? He's put in a little bit of himself. And when he pours out who he is on the earth, it's going to devastate the earth. Why? Because it's been cursed by sin. And it's going to take a toll upon the sinful of earth. Why? Because they are tainted with sin. And they are cursed with sin. But when God demonstrates his holiness, there is a reaction that's going to happen. Well, in order for God to put himself into those vials, his judgment into those vials, how does God judge righteously? Well, what's his measuring stick? Himself. Because he is. He's a self-sufficient God. The holy God. The all-powerful God. All-knowing God. All-present God. 
He puts himself into the vial and then pours it out as judgment, saying, in order to meet my qualification, this is what you got to meet. And they can't. Does not the Bible say that our God is a consuming fire? What do you think happens when God reveals himself? Anything that's not God melts away. So when it says that the temple was full of smoke from the glory of God and from his power, why couldn't any man walk into that temple? Why couldn't John the Revelator go into that temple and see God? Because God has truly revealed himself inside of that temple. Doesn't it say that it was filled with the smoke from his glory and his power? Since the dawn of man's disobedience in the garden, God hasn't revealed his true righteousness to the world. In all its pure con concentrated form. Peter, James, and John just got a glimpse of what Jesus really was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and it blew their minds. Imagine how much more when God truly reveals Himself in full glory and takes His power to put the wrath of God into seven vials and then send some out to pour out that wrath upon the world. God is exercising all power even though He's always had all power. If Christ came in His full glory, no man would have been able to even look at Him. We wouldn't have been able to discern His voice. His touch would have wiped us out of existence. Why? Because He's holy. But God finally decides to exercise what He is, and the temple of God in glory gets so thick that nobody can go in. Keep in mind, John the Revelator, he doesn't have that new body yet. He can't even see past the smoke of God's glory, let alone to see the power of God. Why is the temple full? Because God has to exercise that power until all seven of those vials are empty. And as the angels pour it out, God has to enforce that judgment. Why is it full? Because God in fullness reveals himself to the world but no man can look into that temple and see what's going on that's God's right to judge it's God's mandate that he would judge and it's God's verdict reserved to them that in the first place wouldn't see him by faith well let's go back if you will Verse number 2, it says that he saw his worst single glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten a victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. They stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Now, what are them harps? Well, obviously the harps are identified by who they're associated with. They're not man's harps, they're God's harps. What are the harps made of? Whatever God wanted them to be made of. But see, those harps were dedicated to one thing. Singing praises, bringing glory unto God. Notice, if you will, if you go down to verse number 3, it says, And they sing. Where are they standing at? On the sea of glass mingled with fire. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Well, they've already got two songs queued up. There's destruction and lifelessness all around them, but yet they're fixing to sing two songs. Well, the first one, it says, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who should not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. 
then after that it says that the tabernacle in heaven was open why does the glory of God fill the temple in heaven well, why did the glory of God fill the temple of Solomon because they had prayed and dedicated the house unto God because they had finally culminated in doing their very best using the best materials and the best workmanship to put together for all intents and purposes the most beautiful building and edifice that man has ever created with its hands and it was reserved for one purpose for God to have a place a house among his people because David's heart was smitten by the fact that God lives in a tent, a tabernacle. That he has no permanent place, but yet his people that God had blessed had roofs over their head, had beds to lay down in. That God had been good to his people, but his people hadn't been good back to God. Well, for about at least three and a half years, maybe longer, not quite seven, but longer than three and a half. Everything on the face of this earth had been dedicated to what? Glorifying man, glorifying the devil, glorifying the antichrist, giving in to sin, magnifying sin, and multiplying sin upon the face of the earth. And here, you got a couple of people out in the middle of nowhere standing on top of complete devastation and destruction no life around and yet they bust out some musical instruments they start strumming and notice the very first words great and marvelous are thy works Lord God Almighty they're standing in the midst of a world that hates them and is persecuting them and for all we know is throwing everything and the kitchen sink at them trying to wipe them off the face of the earth. And what do they revel in? The works of God, not man. They are more impressed with what God hasn't done but they know will do than what the world has shown and all their fierce anger and animosity towards God's people, they say, Lord, we've seen a whole lot, but we haven't seen anything great other than you. It says, I mean, they call him Lord God Almighty. He said, great and marvelous are thy works. Why wouldn't they be when he's got all power? Great and marvelous. They're not just great in scope and in power. What do they do? They mystify man man marvels at what it is that God does they say Lord we don't have any idea all that is happening how you're orchestrating everything in our lives right now but we know that you do all things well they're great and they're marvelous every time the antichrist and his crowd show up they try to kill him what happens they marvel at how God delivered them from the hand of the enemy and when God delivers them, there's nothing the enemy can do because God's hand's too mighty and too powerful. There's no resisting when God does something. Then it says, Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. First they magnify him for his power. Then, in the latter half, they magnify him for his position. They called him the Almighty, capital A, in the first half of that verse or that stanza, whatever you want to call it. And in the second half, they called him King, capital K, of the saints. They say, Lord, you're very powerful. In fact, you're so powerful that it, we can't even wrap our heads around what you're doing when we actually see how powerful you are. But then they say, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Why is he just and true? Because he's righteous. Because it's impossible for God to lie. Because God, by his very existence, is proof that he is what he is. That's why he told Moses that I am, that I am. But it says, just and true, or thy ways, thou king of saints. Why is he king? Because he's just and true. 
Because he is righteous. Because he's holy. His position is not something that was given to him. His position is something that he's always had. He's always been the king of kings and lord of lords. Before there ever was a king on earth, God was still king of kings. Before there ever was a lordship that was given out to somebody over in England, right, where they were given a dukedom or an earldom. Long before there ever was a lord on earth, he was still lord of lords. But you also see his possession in that latter part. It says king of saints. What does God possess? Well, God possesses everything. It's all to his. But they don't call him king of everything. They call him king of the saints. You see what's important to God. Why is God doing great and marvelous things right now to protect his people? Before this happened, what did God send his people to do? We heard about it all week this week during the conference. To go out and to turn others into converts. Why? So that he could have more saints as his people. God's power is what? Preserved the church. Preserved his word. Preserved his will upon the face of the earth. Why? So that more saints can come and join the family. You see what is precious to God in his position. God didn't have to care about us, but he chose to. And he's identified as king because that's his position, but we also see his people, his possession, the saints. He's not just identified as the king because he is the king. But he's king of a people that the world didn't want, but that God welcomed with open arms. Well, then it says in verse number four, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? They say, Lord, when this world gets a good look at you, we've seen everything that the world can throw at us. Remember, they're standing on a sea of glass that's mingled with fire. They've seen the full destructive capability of the Antichrist and his crowd. They say, Lord, we're not impressed. But they say, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? They just talked about his great and powerful works. The works of the Almighty. The ones that they found marvelous. They say, Lord, we've seen what you can do. Whatever they can throw at us in a drop in a bucket. But Lord, when you do pour out upon this world, your judgment upon this world, who will be able to resist bowing down and magnifying and glorifying thy name out of fear, reverence, and worship? Like as if God truly revealed himself, there's no, well, I don't believe he's God. No. It's without doubt. It's indisputable. Satan himself knows it. He doesn't like to remember it. But he knows there's coming a day. And on that day, he'll have to bow and proclaim that Jesus is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But says, Who should I fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. What is prompt this worship? Wrath. God's judgment. When God pours out His judgment, man are without excuse not to worship and to make known that God is who He said He was. You know what's going to happen for the entire Great Tribulation? It's already started now, but you know what's going to become completely compulsory during the Great Tribulation? Everything that everyone does is an attempt to deny the very existence of God. The beast is known as what? The Antichrist. Because he is the antithesis of Christ, the exact opposite. That prophet, what's he going to say? Jesus didn't exist. Jesus was a fairy tale. Jesus couldn't do what this one did. Jesus tried to kill this beast and wounded him in the head, but he healed from it. Look at that thing. He should have died, but he didn't. And then the world will buy into it and propagate it and continue to advance it until what? 
until God pours out his wrath as a consequence of their actions. For seven years, everyone's going to be about to the point where they don't even retain God in their conscience. They've been able to dearly forget completely about God. Yeah, those seven seals, and yeah, those seven horns. They always explain it away. They always see how the beast has an answer for it. They always see how as long as they follow in line with the one that they accepted, either in their hand or in their forehead, then everything's going to be all right. Until what? Until God's wrath is poured out. God's people are worshiping, singing songs unto God before the temple is opened in heaven. It says that it was filled with the glory, the smoke came from the glory of God and His power. It wasn't just His glory, it was also His power. But why did it start getting smoky in the tabernacle? It started because God allowed it. But I do believe that it cloud that smoked started forming when God's people who in the eyes of the world had absolutely no reason to go out and start singing to God but they went out on God's harps and just started singing songs so it's the song of Moses that's God's man then it says Moses the servant of God and the song of the Lamb capital L who's that well that's God's Savior. They go out singing on God's instruments the song of God's servant and God's Savior when they have no reason in the flesh to do so. That's true worship. Don't know that they felt like it, but they went out and they did it. Don't know that they were having the best day. They were standing on a sea of glass mingled with fire. Sand's hot enough. Imagine how hot glass mingled with fire is to walk upon or to stand over. I remember what is, it's been a long time, but I still remember when we had to run out on the track in the hot summer heat. The track was black. Black things get hot but yet they'd make you get down in the football stats. I remember how hot that stupid track was on my fingers. I remember feeling the heat just coming off of it. Why can't we run in the grass? It's not as hot over there. Stop asking dumb questions. I don't think that's a dumb question. I think that's a pretty smart question. How come we can't run in the grass? It's colder over there. You're in the shade over here. Well, it wasn't in the shade 10 minutes ago and the track's still hot. I'd rather run in the sun where it's not as hot. But where are they? They're in a place of complete and utter desolation, and yet they still have what? Victory. Go back to verse number 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast. Didn't say that they will have victory, that it's a promised victory. No. Doesn't say that victory is on the way. It says that they already had it. Had gotten victory. That's past tense. They already had victory over who? The beast. And over his image. And over his mark. And over the number of his name. That whole crowd had victory over what? Everything that the Antichrist had tried to do. Where are they standing? Well, the world would say they're standing in a pretty hopeless place. But no, they already had victory. They weren't calling and singing songs unto God asking for deliverance. When do you ask for deliverance? When you don't have the victory. And you ask God to deliver you so that you will have victory. They're not asking God to do anything. They're praising God for what He's already done and what He's going to do. They're just saying, Lord, you're a good God. One of these days, everybody's going to have to admit, all nations, all tongues, all people, that you are the Almighty. You are the King of the saints. You are altogether lovely. And I have to bow down and worship you in fear and reverence, not in falsehood, 
not in a way of mocking. They're not going to be able to say it in a vain or an empty way. They're going to have to sincerely bow before you and admit, confess in true reverence that you are God. They say, God, with that, why would we want to trust in anybody else? They say, He's just, that He's righteous, He's pure. They're saying, Lord, we don't care what they can do to us. We know that you always have a reason. Lord, whether we become part of this sand and we're destroyed, whether you come back and redeem us, whether the Antichrist finally does catch up to us. They say, you're still worthy of praise. They already had victory. Now that's just this chapter in the book of Revelation. Because they had victory, they were able to go out, they were able to sing and worship. But as I read this chapter, the parallel and the inference that I see is we got a lot of Christians walking around today defeated. When did God's people in chapter number 15 of the book of Revelation, when did they have victory? When they rejected the Antichrist and embraced God. That's where their victory came. They didn't have victory on this day because God just gave them victory. They had always had it. God gave them or imparted unto them the victory the moment that they rejected the one that stood against everything that God stands for. Keep in mind, it was had gotten victory, past tense. Who gave them the victory? God. They didn't give themselves the victory, but they had already gotten it a long time ago. On their roughest days, you know what they remembered? <laughs> we still win. Doesn't matter what he does to us. Yeah, we might have to run in the middle of the night. Yeah, we might have to drop everything and start over from scratch again. Yeah, we might have to say goodbye to everyone and everything that we've ever known. We may have to live in the wilds. The wilds that even nowadays you go out, even with all your fancy hunting or camping equipment, and you get out there, you run out of matches, it's going to be cold. If your flint striker don't work, you're going to die. You drink bad water, what's going to happen? It's going to kill you. The wild is not pleasant for man to dwell in. In fact, why is it called wild? Because it's untamed. Man hadn't exerted his hand against the wild places. But yet, even if they're in a place that's so inhospitable to human life. And yet, what does God keep doing? He just keeps providing. They didn't have victory when the food showed up. They had victory before that. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Too many Christians have forgotten that they already won. You don't win when you get to heaven. That's the icing on the cake. You won the day that you trusted by faith in the work that Christ did on Calvary, believing that He had been buried and rose again three days later, that He was the perfect Lamb. Did it not say that they sang the song of the Lamb? You want to know why so many Christians don't have victory? because they don't believe what God's already done for them is enough. Those that realize what happened the day that they got saved, they've got victory. Do you ever see somebody that just got saved? Why do you think they're so happy? Because for the first time in their life, they're no longer in bondage. They have victory. Well, what causes them to lose that? A whole bunch of stuff, but none of it's God. God still gives you the victory today. God never took the victory away from you. God gave it to you that, why? You might have life and life more abundant. Jesus said, I've come to make you alive, to give you victory in a world that's full of death. But then what was the other song that they sang? They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. We heard about it a little bit this week, but you want to know why so many Christians are so miserable and they've lost the victory? Because they're not busy in the Father's business. Getting busy in the world is going to get, rob you of your victory. You've still got victory, you just forget it. But yet Moses, the servant of God, what was he always concerned with? Leading God's people. Being where he was so that spiritually he could do for others what God expected him and instructed him to do for others. 
If you stop serving, you're going to lose victory real quick. You can't hold on to victory on your own. God gave it to you. You know who holds victory in your life? The Holy Ghost, which lives and dwells within you. You know why you have victory? Because God put himself in you. Not because you were added into God. God took on your unvictory, your defeat. He took your death and your hell and your grave. And then in return gave him or gave you himself. That's the victory. They did not say that the Lamb was with his people in the wilderness, that they followed after the Lamb in the previous chapters that we read. Why did they have the victory? Because God was with them. But just because God's with you doesn't mean you can't walk away from God. You stop following the Lamb, you stop being a servant of God, you're going to lose victory real quick. Be at these people facing the worst persecution that ever has been or ever will be. Hated and despised by everybody else on the world except those that are in their group. After what could have been, we don't know what turned that sea into glass. We don't know what caused it to be mingled with fire. But imagine that everybody else in the world says, point all the nukes at that spot on the map, and everybody hit the button at the same time. They've just seen the full destructive force of mankind, knowing that there was nothing they could do to stop it. And yet after it's all over, God delivered them. But they come out and they sing songs about being servants of God, and being followers of God. Because God is all-powerful and almighty. His works are wonderful and marvelous. They start singing about the Lamb. And now because of the Lamb being just and pure and everything that was required, we can escape the wrath of God. But even those that endure the wrath of God are still without excuse to admit and to praise and to honor and see Him as the King of of kings they start thinking about the wrath of God and they realize he's my king I don't have to endure his wrath because he made me one of his I was already judged at Calvary for sin I don't have to endure the wrath of God and as they start singing what happens the smoke starts filling in God's house well where are you today you're in the house of God you're not in the tabernacle of the testimony that's in heaven. But you're in a place where God has met with His people. You're in a place that God set aside for you to have a refuge and a haven. What He's saying, if you get a little bit of victory today, deep down in the gable end of your soul, you give back unto God and say, Lord, I don't need, I've already got victory over hell. I've already got victory over the grave. I've already got victory over Satan. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Lord, you've given me so much that I've got victory no matter what happens to me. And you start worshiping him not because of what you desire, but because of who he is and what he's done and what he's promised to do. And you worship him for being a good God, for being almighty, for being the king. Just stand back and watch his house start smell, filling up with a little bit of smoke. Only instead of sending out his judgment, his wrath... He may just step in and he may give you a little bit of his presence, a little bit of his fellowship, and make himself known around the house. And if he really shows up, we're all not going to be able to stand it, and we're all going to have to leave. You say, that can happen? Oh, yeah, I still believe that can happen. It's gotten so big that I've had to get up and go to one of the corners of the room. Well, he's saying, it got close to that big, but I could still stand it being in here. And he's saying, I've never seen it where I can't stand to be around the sanctuary because God made his presence so known I'd like to did you know that IBC is now on iTunes TuneIn SoundCloud and Google Play head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today and as always thanks for listening